based in Los Angeles. And she is a staff attorney with the Children's Representation Project at Immigrant Defenders Law Center. She is a Seattle native uh, who definitely misses the reign of Western Washington. She is licensed to practice law in Washington and is a registered legal aid attorney under the multi-jurisdictional practice program in California. And she also worked from 2016 to 2020 with the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project in their Tacoma office. So she has a lot of experience working with children and families um, in the Olympic Peninsula in southwestern Washington um, and, and helping them with their struggles through the immigration system. So now I am going to turn it over to Anna Ray, and we are very happy to have her here today. Thank you, Soleil. Um, and I'm happy to be here as well. Um, so basically, Soleil said it all. Um, I am a staff attorney. Um, at the Immigrant Defenders Law Center in Los Angeles. And I've been here for about a year, actually almost exactly a year. Um, and before that, for four and a half years, I was an attorney at Northwest Immigrant Rights Project's Tacoma office. And in that office, I was serving children and families that lived all over the Olympic Peninsula. So from Forks to Shelton, all the way down to Vancouver, Washington, Jehalis, and I also even did some work um, in Eastern Washington as well on occasion. Uh, so I, I got a lot of time to go out and get to know kids in different communities all over Washington state. And I really, I really miss working there. Um, I, at the time was focusing mostly on children but I also did some adult work. And now I am completely a children's attorney. Um, so the change in my practice includes that I now am representing some detained children as well as children who have been released to their families. So today, one of the things I will talk a little bit about is children in detention. Um, yeah. So essentially, this is, this is a little overview. So I'm gonna start with, um, everyone's always curious about what's going on with the border right now, and it's changing all the time, especially after the Trump administration and then the pandemic, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of stalls at the border and a lot of things have changed recently. And then I want to talk about how children end up in our communities in Washington state and all over the country. So how do we get from the Southern border to your, your small town um, or large town as it may be? I'll talk a little bit about immigration court uh, and then we're going to go into um, discussing five or six different forms of immigration relief that are the most common forms of immigration relief for child survivors of violence. And this is, it's not gonna be exhaustive, but it's just a little overview. Um, and after that, I'll talk a little bit about encountering immigration children in your work, um, immigrant children in your work, and um, how you can help them, where you can find immigration help for them. And then finally, if we run out, if we don't run out of time, I've got a little bit of information about um, ICE encounters, but if not, we can send out that information later. As far as questions go, um, we'll definitely have time for questions at the end, but it would be lovely if you have questions throughout because I understand it's a lot of information and a lot of probably new information for many people. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature to type in a question and periodically I'll pause for questions as we go and have Soleil let it, um, announce the question. Um, and I'll answer them as best I can. All right. So first, what's going on at the southern border? If you've been reading the news at all, you would see that there is um, a huge influx of children and families coming into the southern through the United States to the southern border. And this is a this is a surge that does include a lot of children without parents. And this chart is not completely up to date at this point. I think um, according to the Customs and Border Patrol website, um, in March 2021, what this little chart doesn't include was um, 168,195 encounters at the southwestern border. So that brings us up in here into this range of the, of the chart. Um, an, an encounter could mean both apprehending people or expelling them. So it's not, it's not completely a clean term. Um, so we're referring to it as a surge, but I think it's better characterized as like an influx because generally 
we're, we're dealing with a lot of pent up demand from a la last year. There's a lot of reasons why people weren't immigrating and weren't crossing the border in the last two or three years. And so now we're seeing a lot of people who may have come earlier, but just weren't able to. Additionally, spring and summer is the traditional time for there to be um, a peak of migration at the southern border, but it does vary from year to year. And of course, with the pandemic, there have been some um, pandemic and climate change, there have been some kind of worsening factors in some of the countries that we often see migration from. Um, that means that people are people are ready to um, flee their countries. So in I, we often talk about um, push factors for migration and pull factors. So a pull factor would be, I want to come because there's work for me, or my mom lives there. Whereas a push factor is when you're fleeing your country for some reason. And in my personal experience of all the families and children I've encountered, I most generally see people fleeing their country, not coming to the United States necessarily because they want to, but because they truly feel like they will die if they stay in their home countries. Um, <clears throat> for my children, I generally see them fleeing gang violence and extortion and recruitment. And this can be often, you know, young boys being recruited to join the gangs. Often young girls are, are requested to be the girlfriend of a gang member. Um, and then, Overlying all of this is threats that if you do not join or if you do not become my partner, then we're going to kill you. Um, they are, yeah, so there are also um, a lot of domestic violence that children are fleeing um, and extreme poverty, especially um, recently exacerbated by you know horrible, horrible flooding um, due to hurricanes like Hurricane Eta and Iota that hit um, Nicaragua and Honduras. Um, there's also a lot of persecution based on ethnicity. Many, um, many immigrant children in the United States are indigenous. So especially for me, when I was in Washington, if um, there were communities in Shelton and in Forks that were you know, big indigenous communities of children and families from um, Central America. I'm talking a lot about children and families from Central America because that is most of what I see. Um, generally, the clients that trickle into the United States um, as unaccompanied minors are from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Um, however, I have recently been seeing a much larger influx in children from Mexico um, in recent days, and additionally, indigenous children from Mexico that don't speak Spanish. And I don't know if this is also true in Washington, but it's certainly true down here in California. I think before this year, when normally when if I encountered a Mexican client, it would have been someone whose family had already been in the United States for a while. So there's certainly um, some change. So what was going on that made people not come into the United States in the past couple of years? Um, well, of course, there was the pandemic, which not only caused, you know, border delays in the United States, but between other countries as well. So it was harder to leave their home countries and travel into other countries due to the borders being shut. And when migrants are coming um, through the southern border, even though it's a lot of Central um, Americans, we've also got migrants coming, flying over from Africa and from other countries coming up from further in South America and coming through that southern border. So when borders were shut, it made this, this flow of migrants just cut off. Additionally, um, starting in January, 2019, Trump implemented the Remain in Mexico policy or migrant protection protocols. And this was a, a policy that essentially forced migrants to wait outside of the United States in Mexico and it was only allowing them to enter into the United States to go to court um, for their asylum trial. And at that point, they would either be um, immediately expelled or admitted. Of course, there was no infrastructure set up to support all of these families that had to wait in Mexico for their, um, for their hearings. 
Uh, and this meant that a lot of incredibly dangerous refugee camps um, spread up along the border. And I did speak um, with some families that were stuck in Mexico. I remember talking to a mother who said that the room, their roommate had just been kidnapped and that she was you know, terrified of sexual assault, of the families being extorted. There was no way they could find work and they were just desperate. They felt like if they went back to their home country, they would be killed, but they were worried that they would be killed um, simply waiting in those refugee camps. <clears throat> and so I know that some of those thousands of refugees did end up leaving the border, whether they were going home or finding another place, I'm not sure. Um, and then ultimately in, by the end of, or I think actually the beginning of March, um, Biden did allow, um, end of this policy. And so the remaining um, migrants emptied out. Um, but those camps just were, it was extremely unsafe conditions. And the Mexican country, the Mexican government didn't de designate them as refugee camps. So the UN did not come in, in to help with sanitation or providing any infrastructure, which made them even more dangerous and did deter um, people from even trying to seek asylum. Um, yes. All right. So now how, if you are a Central American child, do you get to the United States? Um, the means of transportation really varies. Uh, I know back in like 2013, 2014, we would hear sometimes of migrants riding on top of a train, the Cordillera de Estia. Um, personally, for me, my clients generally tell me that they take buses. So they'll get a bus ticket, take bus after bus to travel from Central America up to Mexico. Sometimes they drive in private cars. Um, sometimes families hire coyotes. So um, people whose job it is to um, take children or families or you know, individuals and help them get into the United States. Um, additionally, um, I'm sure you've heard of the migrant caravans. This trip is incredibly dangerous especially for a child, especially for a female. You know, there are, um, there are instances of sexual assault, kidnapping, trafficking. I have met clients who have said that the coyote who was helping them then forced them to traffic drugs along the border. So the idea behind the migrant caravan is like, let's all just travel together. You know, we'll have some safety in numbers um, if we're traveling in a really visible manner. And so, um, when you hear about a migrant caravan, it's just been real. A whole lot of people have decided to like try to protect themselves and make themselves more safe by um, traveling all together in a group. <clears throat> so there are two different ways um, to enter the United States. So the first one is entering at a port of entry. Um, and that can be through air. You can come in, you know, in an airplane or you could, I guess you could also come in by boat, though I have not seen that in my clients, um, or often, you know, on foot or in a car at a land port of entry. Um, and if you are seeking asylum, you can come to that port of entry. And then when, if you don't have a visa, you say, I'm here asking for asylum. And when that happens, you would be immediately taken to a CBP holding facility. And we'll talk more about what those look like um, in just a minute. The other option is to enter without inspection. So to cross the border, not at um, a port of entry. Um, my clients have told me that they um, will go through the river, they'll walk through the desert, or they'll climb over the wall. And they say, you use a ladder to get over the wall. You climb up a tree, you're over the wall. It's not, it's not hard to get over the wall, um, even for small children. So <clears throat> most of them, they know the, um, the Customs and Border, Border Patrol is coming. They don't try to evade them. Generally, my child clients tell me that they sit there and wait because they know they'll be there any minute. They've been told they'll be there any minute. Sometimes they'll walk through the, I'll hear that they'll walk through the desert for a few hours. Um, but often it'll be within, um, I would say five to 30 minutes that they are um, apprehended by CBP agents. Um, and then there again, just like if you entered through a port of entry, you're brought to a holding facility. Okay. All right, so this is an old picture, it's from 2015, um, <clears throat> but it's still pretty true today. Um, 
people are held in la llenera, which is a term for the ice box. So imagine you've been in the desert, it's really, really hot. Um, you might not have a jacket or shorts, and then you're brought into this holding facility where the air conditioning is just cranked up all the way. It's very, very cold. I mean, there have been reports of people like getting hypothermia or getting ill from you know how cold it is in these holding facilities, and you're given like a little foil blanket like you just ran a marathon. Um, and this is a, a space where people are held where they're getting processed. You know, adults may be sent to um, an adult detention facility, um, or they'll they could, in certain circumstances they're sent back, um, in, you know, immediately back into Mexico. Uh, if you are a parent who enters a country with a child, you're generally released, just released on your own recognizance with the children. So what that means is that you are going to be released under monitoring, um, but kind of, you know, you, you, you know that you've got to go back or else they will find you. <laughs> um, so generally what this means is they will have to have um, check-ins fairly frequent. They'll get less frequent if you've been doing a good job of always checking in. You'll have to go to a local ICE office. And ICE is also sometimes contracting with other agencies to supervise individuals through ankle bracelets, so ankle monitors, um, telephonic reporting or GPS tracking and like unannounced visits at your home. So you're out there living in your community. Your children are able to go to school and have a life. However, it's not that you're free to stay there. You're still in deportation proceedings and you're, you're being watched over by ICE through a variety of different tracking methods. Um, but it's a much less restrictive facility than any sort of detention facility. So it, oh, it looks like there is a question. <laughs> Yes, and all right. Um, so we have a question that came in that is um, normally how long, like how many minutes or what time period does it take for um, for the child or the person before CVP will get to them? I mean, I think it really varies, but sometimes I hear it's a couple hours. Sometimes it's just a few minutes. Sometimes they're like literally there waiting for them on the other end. In very rare circumstances, they completely evade them, but I've like literally only met two people who've done that in the past couple of years. So, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, yes, like last week I had an intake with a client who said it was a couple hours for him. So, yeah. right. Um, let's say you're a child traveling alone or not with a parent. <clears throat> so this is one thing I'm not gonna talk um, you know, for time purposes about the children being separated from their parents at the border several years ago. Uh, but you should still know that there is still separation happening at the border. If you're a child who enters the country um, with a non-parent family member, you will be separated from them and you will be considered an unaccompanied minor. Now, you could be traveling with your grandma who raised you your entire life or your older brother who is you know, 22 years old and you're 17 or you're six years old and those are parent, you know, we're parent figures in their life, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. They don't care if you're related, that person will be treated as an adult and follow whatever adult policies there are and the child will be treated as unaccompanied. And obviously this is incredibly traumatic um, for children to be you know, separated from these people um, who are very important figures in their lives. So, Children are designated as unaccompanied alien children when they come in without a parent. Um, we don't use the term alien. Um, it's really dehumanizing. So I would always just refer to them as UCs or unaccompanied children. Um, <clears throat> so unaccompanied children is like an official designation that does confer uh, rights on these children. So they have, um, one of the rights is that they have the, they're supposed to be released to the least restrictive setting possible. And they're only supposed to be held for a maximum of 72 hours in CBP um, facilities. Um, this designation also confers rights that are meant to protect them and provide them a more child-friendly process than adults are exposed to when they're applying for asylum later on. So what happens after the 72 hours? Um, Oops, backwards. Okay, 
So due to this crazy influx of people at the border, we, well, CBP has not been able to process children through um, the, these temporary holding spaces uh, as quickly as they're supposed to. Um, I spoke to a 12 year old yet last week who said he was in um, a CBP custody for nine days. So imagine it's not it's not going to be a whole lot better than that picture you saw. And this is a small child who was in that facility for that line, length of time. And the reason is children are generally released from a CBP facility to a shelter. It's a slightly more long term situation we'll discuss more about. However, and then those people are children are then released to families but they, they're not able to operate as quickly as they can to move all these children through the process. The shelters don't have enough space for them. They're not able to reunify children quickly. Um, <clears throat> so we have kids in terrible conditions that they should not be exposed to. To that end, um, you may have heard that there have been some temporary emergency shelters that have been set up around the country. Now, these pictures that I have right here um, are of, I believe this is the Long Beach Convention Center. So in Texas and definitely here in California, we've got at least one facility in Long Beach, one facility in Pomona, and I think one in San Diego too, but they're using convention centers to house, um, uh, to house children right now. <clears throat> I mean, this is, it's, what, well, what my organization has been saying is like, this is better than the other option, which is CDP custody. But of course, children are not supposed to be held in convention centers. Um, this is not good for their development. Uh, we always know that it doesn't matter how nice the facilities are, how attentive the staff is, it's not healthy for children to spend time in large congregate care facilities. Um, the hope is that these convention centers will be dismantled as quickly as that they were put up. Um, I believe the one in Pomona uh, opened today and the one in Long Beach opened last week. So this is like just happening right now. Um, they are uh, trying to take as good a care of these kids as they can. They're receiving um, food, uh, education, medical screenings. You can see they're giving them little like stuffed animals and blankets and shoes. Um, one of my colleagues told me that they're in one of the convention centers, they've got like a little kind of store space where they can go and choose clothes for themselves. So they're giving the kids a little bit of like their own agency. Um, my organization, Immigrant Defenders Law Center, has been detailed to do legal screenings at these sites. I haven't done any yet. Um, I probably will in, uh, in a little bit. Um, so we are there to provide Know Your Rights presentations and to have um, consultations with the children. We, we, you know, there's only so much information you can give kids when they're, you know, this scared. And um, I do know that the facility my, my coworkers have been working at has been mostly tender age kids. So kids under the age of 12. So we're talking, you know, small, small kids um, that aren't gonna understand all the legal jargon and are gonna be really scared. So we're just trying to provide them with uh, age appropriate, um, information um, and make sure that they're doing okay and that they do have access to like legal assistance. Um, and we can help when issues arise. So yeah, that's a pretty alarming thing that's going on, though I think it's even better. Um, it's much better than being in CDP custody. And truly the hope is that um, these kids will be released as quickly as possible to family members. All right. So Normally, when a child leaves CDP custody, um, they are sent to an ORR shelter. Um, I'm sure the time they spend there varies dramatically, dramatically. I think at this point, the minimum would be maybe eight days because they're making sure kids quarantine, I think for at least seven um, before releasing them you know, for COVID purposes. Um, several years ago, I, sometimes, I often, often, um, we're seeing clients who had been held for well over six months, some for over a year, um, in what was supposed to be a temporary shelter facility, like um, situation. Um, so there's quite a shelter system in the United States. As you can see from this map, um, all the dots are different sorts of facilities. 
Um, and I think the, the size of the dot is how many people, you know, how many kids uh, the place can um, hold. This is a slightly outdated map. I think it was updated in like 2017. So imagine there are some other facilities and possibly some of them have been closed down. But I just wanted to give you an idea of um, how, how far across the country these spread. They're not just at the southern border. They're not just in Arizona, in Texas. They're in Chicago. They're in Fife. They're in Portland. They're, they're all over the place. <clears throat> so there are a variety of different shelter settings. First, there's kind of like the traditional typical shelter. They're meant to stay here only temporarily. Um, well, it's well we find, not we, I don't work there. Um, well, the organization finds um, a family member or a friend for them to be released to. Then there are also more secure facilities that are for children who possibly have um, gang history or other criminal backgrounds. Uh, and those are more like kind of a traditional like detention um, setting or a juvie like setting. And then there's also long term foster care programs and long term facilities. Uh, if they cannot find, if the Office of Refugee Resettlement can't find a family member or a friend or anyone who is willing um, to take in the child, they have to have a place to stay. So they end up staying with uh, foster families all over the place. And some of these are group homes where there's multiple kids. Sometimes it's just, you know, the kid and a family, but they're in houses, in communities all over the country. Um, so I wanted to kind of, since I know that many of you or most of you are in Washington state, I wanted to kind of focus in a little on the Pacific Northwest. Um, the map here, these little dots are the different sorts of facilities um, that were present in 2017 in the Puget Sound area. So there are, you know, there are detention facilities um, in, in Washington state and in Portland. Um, and there, these ones are like relatively small. They receive all their legal services from Kids in Need of Defense, which has an office in Seattle, and they're contracted to specifically um, represent all of the children in these areas. So it's unlike it's likely that these children, you know, all have legal assistance already. Um, so uh, how what is the what are the factors that like they have to think about when they're releasing kids? Um, they're looking for someone to step up, come forward. If it's a parent, they can be released, you know, relatively quickly. Um, but if it's a fur, because they can just verify with birth certificates. Um, if it's another family member, it might require, a, you know, either comparing all the birth certificates. So like, oh, you're an aunt, then we need to see your birth certificate and the mom's birth certificate and the kid's birth certificate and we'll connect you up. Um, sometimes there are DNA tests done. Um, additionally, there is some background tests. I have to get, I believe, like fingerprinted. And um, the point of the screening is to ensure that these children aren't trafficked. Um, I don't know how great the screening is, you know, but it, I, sometimes I think they, they drag their feet and kids could be released more quickly. Um, I don't know if it's a perfect process they have, but there is the hope that they're doing, you know, some sort of background check to make sure that the child is being released to um, a safe place. Sometimes children do have family members in the United States, but they're afraid to come forward because they're worried that that will put them on immigration's radar. And in recent years, we haven't really seen enforcement of uh, guardians of children be an issue, but um, several years ago we were. Um, we, I remember when I was at NERP, there was a client who, um, was a, a boy who was really still with his brother and then I showed up at their house. So I can understand why people are scared. Um, I don't think that's an ICE enforcement priority right now, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so ultimately, um, most of these minors are gonna be released to live with um, family members and friends, and those could be anywhere. Um, so that's why you'll find kids who have only been in the United States for a couple of months, but yet they're living in your town. Um, because they've been released to live with family members or friends all over the country. Um, so just because they're released to live in communities does not mean that they can live here forever. It's, it's not just like carte blanche to, to, to live their lives. 
Um, they are still required um, to appear in immigration court proceedings, and they're all placed in basically in deportation proceedings. Um, so they're actively in the process of being deported. Of course, for kids, sometimes this is a little hard to process. You think, oh, I'm happy, I'm living with my mom. And you don't understand that actually you are in the immigration court process and it, um, uh, you're going to have hearings for a matter of years that will determine whether or not you can actually continue to stay in the United States. Um, does anyone have any questions before, before I move on? You can feel free to write them in the Q&A, raise your hand. Okay, so I also want, even though I've been talking a lot about Central American kids coming up through the Southern border, those are not the only immigrants in your communities. Those are not the only undocumented people in your communities. And you really shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Um, there are also immigrants and immigrant kids who are living in our towns who have been in the United States for much of their life. Um, you know, several years back, it was easier to come in the United States undetected. Additionally, people can come in as visa overstays. Oh, there is a question. So before I think that. Um, yes, thank you, Anna Ray. Um, the question in this case is, are shelters considered detention centers in this process? Yes, so children are still considered detained until they've been released to live with a family member or a friend. Um, so ICE has to affirmatively like let them go. And until then, yes, they are considered detained. Um, and when they're detained, they're kind of in like a fast tracked um, immigration court proceedings where they have more frequent immigration hearings. Um, yeah, where they, yeah. So they're, yes, they're still detained. Um, they're still supervised over like by ICE. Um, they're just living not in adult detention facilities. All right, so going back to um, immigrants in your communities. So they're also visa overstays. Uh, so let's say you've come from a, a, on a plane with a visa to, to be a tourist in the United States, and then you stay. You don't depart at the end of your visa when it expires. That's another way people end up in the United States um, without documentation. Um, or people who, for whatever, you know, maybe they were here on a student visa or they were married or uh, you're coming in on that or coming in on like a fiance visa and then they stayed instead of, um, you know, complying with the terms of that visa. Um, and for this reason, you really shouldn't just assume that someone who speaks English with no accent is uh, and doesn't appear to fit your stereotypes has lawful immigration status. Um, I have seen in Washington state, I have had clients who um, were black or Asian, who were European, um, and people had no idea that they were undocumented because they had been here for a long time and had um, culturally, you know, grown up in America, um, but yet they, they did not have status. Um, yes, question. Yes, we have another question that came in, and it actually goes back um, to uh, the releasing minors into to family and friends, and that is, do you know what the requirements are in that vetting process for family members? Like, is criminal history a factor or a certain number of bedrooms, like with other kinds of kinship foster care? Does it vary by state or county in the way that foster care is? Or is it all federal requirements? It's all federal. I don't think it varies by state. I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, from what I've gathered, just from working with families who are guardians, um, there'll be some phone calls. I think they do have to do a background check. So criminal history will be an issue. I think if it's a parent, it's relatively easy to be released, but the further apart your relationship goes, the, the more scrutiny there is into like the fitness. Um, I definitely know they have to like agree to send the children to school. I don't think there's like a bedroom requirement, but I don't, I don't actually know that. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna say things I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what all the criteria is, um, but it is just like, it's federal. It's not like overseen by, by any sort of state agencies or authorities. Yeah. All right. Okay, doke. All right. So I'm not going to talk too much about immigration court because we talk about it forever. Um, but let's talk a tiny bit about it. 
So immigration court is um, the process that a non-citizen would go through to determine if they should be deported from the United States. In an immigration court proceeding, there's two questions. One, are they deportable? So, you know, it might be that the person's actually a citizen, you know, you gotta figure that out first or that they're not deportable for many other reasons. And then if they are deportable, do they have a defense. Do they qualify for something that would allow them to get um, permanent status or uh, some other sort of status here in the United States. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, there are three immigration courts. Um, there is one in Seattle, there's one in Portland, and there's one in Tacoma. Uh, the Seattle Immigration Court, it is in downtown Seattle in an office building, and it serves almost all of, you know, it's like, I think it's all of, almost all of Washington State, unless you're like really close to, um, to Portland. Um, and also people from, you know, from the greater region, like sometimes we'll get like people from Idaho as well. So you have to travel from Eastern Washington to your immigration court hearing over the past in the winter and you gotta show up. It's, it's, um, it's definitely like some access issues, especially for people who live quite far away from Seattle. You know, I had clients in Forks who were waking up at three o'clock in the morning to get to their 8.30 a.m. immigration court hearing in Seattle. Um, I have a picture of the courtrooms on the next slide and you'll see there, the ones in Seattle are very small. It's like, it's like a, little, a little office room that they've jammed pews into. Uh, it does not feel very, very regal and court-like for sure. Uh, the Tacoma Immigration Court is housed at the detention center in Tacoma. So they're detaining individuals in part of it. And then in the other parts, you've got your judges and your courtroom. Um, so I, yes, I didn't even realize that I was already unmuted. Sorry. Um, and for the courtrooms during COVID, do they still have to show up in person or has that changed at all? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so no, they don't have to show up in person. Um, <clears throat> except for detention facilities, I actually don't know how they're doing in an adult detention facility. So I'm not going to talk about that, but, um, for children's cases, um, for, ch for children's detained cases, we are still having hearings, but only the attorneys need to appear. And we do that by telephone. So we're doing telephonic hearings um, for detained children. Those ones are moving forward. For my non-detained clients, they keep getting their hearings continued. So they, they have a hearing date and then like six weeks before we'll get a notice saying it's been moved out. Um, and this is causing the process to move even slower than it already, already does. Um, I just had a child the other day who was set for their very first hearing in immigration court, and they've set it out for, um, I think, February 2023. So that's going to be the very first time that he ends up um, in front of an immigration judge. <clears throat> uh, they are so non-detained, so people who are just you know families living living out in communities they're going forward with what we refer to as merits hearings. Um, believe in person for the most part, uh, though I think you can request a WebEx hearing, you would need to make that request and otherwise it would be in person. And so those are the big final hearings, like where you're having a trial to determine whether or not you win asylum. Um, those are still going on. Though so I believe at like a reduced, definitely a reduced capacity. I know in LA it's like, Basically, there's only one judge in the building at the time. So, so the capacity has been like, you know, really, really cut. And I'm sure in Seattle it's I'm sure in Seattle it's similar that they might have one judge in there doing hearings a, like a week or something. Um, and it changes week to week. They're not good at saying, like, oh, you know, this is how it's gonna be through the end of you know August. They're telling us like, you know, every three weeks they're giving us updates. And each court throughout the country is handling it different. Um, whoops, I did want to say. So another just important thing that you should know is that there is not a, there is no like appointed counsel, even for children. Um, if you can't afford a private attorney, can't have an attorney. Uh, for detained children, there's a, there is a more like funding and resources. Um, but for a child just living with their family and a community, they need to find their own. Uh, nonprofits are incredibly overtaxed um, and it's terrible, but like you have a much, much higher chance of success 
if you appear um, in an immigration court with an attorney. It's a really complicated process um, to present a good case and the access to counsel, you know, to affordable counsel and the fact that, you know, many of these people, they don't have work permits. How are they supposed to be able to afford someone? Um, it's, it's, it's really a challenge. Uh, and as I meant, touched on before, the process is incredibly, incredibly slow. Uh, even in the non-COVID times, you will be waiting five years, you know, three to five years probably before your final trial. Detained courts for adults move a whole lot quicker. Um, you know, you can be like in and out within, if you're lucky, five or six months, sometimes faster, sometimes much, much slower. But uh, for the immigration courts like in Seattle and Portland, you're looking at years, years of waiting until your final hearing. And of course, in the meantime, you're becoming part of a community. You're making friends, you're going to school, um, you know, you're just getting adjusted. And that, that still doesn't mean that you're going to be able to stay at the end of everything. So here, this might be, maybe this is, maybe this is the Tacoma court. I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure what court this is, but this is kind of a, an idea of what the court is. It's fairly small. You can't really tell, but they're very, very little. I'm sure there are some that are slightly nicer, but in my experience, they're teensy, teensy courtrooms that are even smaller than the one in this picture. Oftentimes you have to wait in the hallway for your turn because they'll set a bunch of people's hearings at the same time. And so if you go to the Seattle um, court, uh, like the time of the docket's about to start, there's gonna be just the hallway and the, and the tiny waiting room just, just jammed with people. Um, also bad for COVID. All right, <clears throat> are there any questions about immigration court before I move on to talking about different um, forms of relief? No, good, okay. Um, really quickly, this will probably be covered in your forms of relief, but we did have a question that said, what are the exam some examples of defense defenses to deportation that get approved and ones that get denied? Well, they can improve and get denied. They can all be approved and they can all be denied, but I will, I will talk about them now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, you're in deportation proceedings. You need to have some sort of defense. So how, how do these children living in your community, how do they end up getting some sort of lawful status in the country? So there's two forms of relief. There's defensive, um, which is like I mentioned, if you're in immigration proceedings, you need defense. So you're gonna wanna file anything you might qualify for and just, you know, even forms that, you know, they're not frivolous, they might be weak, but like totally worth it to just try for it. Then there's also affirmative forms of relief. So. Those are ones that, you know, you've, you've been here a while, you now qualify for some sort of um, pathway to status. You are not in deportation proceedings, um, but you are going to, you know, ask the government for status um, by filing this type of relief um, with uh, US Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, and those ones are not done in a courtroom. They're done, they're adjudicated. So it's an officer in an office, that looks at your application, oftentimes there would be an interview required, um, but it's technically a non-adversarial process. Of course, if you're filing an affirmative form of relief, so you know, sticking your neck out there and it gets denied, you're running the risk of then being put into deportation proceedings if it's denied, and then you would have to find some sort of defense and apply for, um, um, you know, use a defensive form of relief. Okay, and you can file for all, all of these like defensively. So asylum is one you hear about quite a bit. Um, so I think it's important to know that there, asylum is the same thing as like refugee status. The uh, difference is that you apply for asylum from within a country and refugee status you apply from outside of the country. Um, there's not a lot of opportunities for people to apply for refugee status unless they're in like an actual refugee camp. Um, <clears throat> So a lot of people have to come to the United States to ask for these protections. Uh, and the definition, you know, it's protection for individuals who are unable to return to their country of origin because of persecution on account or, or fear of future persecution or past persecution on account of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Now, particular social group is a term of art and it's kind of a catch-all. Um, it's meaning that you're part of 
some sort of identifiable social group where all people share the same characteristic that's fundamental to their individual identities. And the members of this group cannot or should not be expected to, expected to change it. So you know, lawyers spend a ton of time creating these social groups and kind of building arguments around what, what it constitutes um, a social group. It can be based on a variety of traits from your ethnic group to your social class, um, occupational groups or around gender, sexual orientation. Um, so I've seen them, you know, such as uh, LGBT individuals from X country or family members of the insert name here country or um, females who have suffered female genital mutilation. You know, they're, we are creative with them <laughs> to try and make facts stick within one of these groups. You should note that there's nothing on here that's like a, a a climate refugee clause. And also there's no um, ability to uh, get asylum just for some sort of personal private disputes. So there's often situations where people like very, very much have a real fear of death in their home countries where asylum is still not going to be an option. Oh my God, so has I been signed out? All right, no, I'm still, I'm still here, right? I haven't, I haven't gone anywhere. You're still here. Okay, good, I just got a Zoom pop up, not at me. All right, good. <laughs> okay, so for asylum, there is a deadline. You generally need to file within a year of entry in the United States. There are exceptions. And one of those exceptions is being um, an unaccompanied minor. Uh, so children have, can, can, can it doesn't matter if it's been within one year, they can apply regardless of that, which is wonderful. Um, and so asylum is a, is a pathway to lawful permanent status. So if you are able to win your asylum case, whether it's with um, USCIS in an office or in front of the um, immigration judge, you will be eligible after a year after you receive asylum status to apply for lawful permanent residence. Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, so special immigrant juvenile status is my bread and butter often because um, when I was in Washington, my funding was tied towards uh, towards working with children and families who had been um, survivors of violence. And so special immigrant juvenile status is right up the alley for like these sorts of clients that would admit my funding. And I do a, quite a bit of it here in California as well. It's a protective status for children that's based on parental maltreatment. So you have to have been abandoned, abused or neglected by one of your parents or both of your parents in order to be eligible for the status. And again, it, visa approval will eventually enable the child to apply for lawful permanent residency. It doesn't matter um, what country this happened in. It could happen in the home country or it could be happening here in the United States. So if you're a person who works often with children who are in the dependency system, who have been placed into foster care and who have an ongoing dependency case or the equivalent in your state, they will be eligible for this almost, almost certainly. Um, so that would be a good thing to flag if you see that you're working with a child in foster care and you know that they're not documented, this is an opportunity for them that they really shouldn't miss out on. Five requirements are here. Um, they need to be under 21, unmarried, um, and they either need to be a dependent or they need to be legally placed by the court into the custody of either a state agency or department or placed under the custody of an individual or entity. So what that means is there either needs to be a, a guardianship placing them with, um, with a, a friend or a family member as their legal guardian. They either need to be in a dependency or their parents need to get a custody order. Like, um, like let's say dad gets a custody order saying mom is unfit because she abandoned the child. That's also an um, opportunity. And there's, there's a variety of other ways as well, but those are probably the most common ones in Washington. Um, Again, like I mentioned, reunification with one or both parents cannot be viable on account of abuse, abandonment, neglect, or a similar, a similar basis um, as stated under state law. And it has to not be in their best interest to return to their home country. Now, I've written out the steps to this one because <clears throat> it's a long process. It's not, it's not easy and it takes years. Um, all of these processes take years, unfortunately. So step one is obtaining the state court order, like I mentioned. Um, so there's a variety of different pathways to doing it. 
but you've got to get a judge, a state court judge to sign an order saying you've been abandoned, abused, or neglected. Once you have this paper in hand, then your attorney can file the application for special immigrant juvenile status. We send it off to immigration and you wait for approval. And currently it's under six months. When I was practicing a few years ago, it was like a year and a half wait, but now we're more looking at like four months, which is like very welcome because the wait used to be so very long. So yay, it's approved. Well, unfortunately that doesn't mean much. You don't have a work permit and you don't have status. Now you need to wait until there's um, a visa available. There are so many kids from Central America and Mexico and the United States waiting um, for this opportunity that there is a really, really long wait list. So right now, to like kind of put in perspective like where we are in this wait list, if you filed for special immigrant juvenile status in September 2018, now you're eligible to apply for permanent residency. But everyone who applied after that, they're not eligible. They have to wait. Right now, it's March 2019 for Mexican year. If you're from a different country, great. You can apply for your green card concurrently with special immigrant juvenile status, and you can have it within a year. But generally, that's not the experience. Generally, kids are going to have to wait. Um, and this waiting list, it doesn't just move up like a month every month. Sometimes it will not move for a whole year. Sometimes we'll move backwards. And sometimes we'll move forward like six months. You really don't know. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's frustrating you have to tell these kids like, yay, we've got it. We've applied for your visa. It's been a and your application has been approved. And then they're like, well, I mean, I don't get a work permit and I still have no status. Yes. Um, uh, Soleil, yeah. Yes, we have a question that asks, is there a yearly cap as there is with the U visa? Um, it's it's kind of different, but yes, there's a, there's a quota. So I don't know the exact number. Um, I think it's, yeah, I don't know the exact number, but there, there is a cap and that's why there's this wait list. So every month we get the visa bulletin comes out and you can see um, you can see where, where the numbers are at and who is allowed to apply and who isn't apply, allowed to apply. And then eventually when they finally have a current date, uh, they're able to apply for permanent residency. Um, and at the same time, they can apply for their work permit. So that's one of the really unfortunate things is these children aren't eligible for work permits. And at that time, They've had time to age. They might be 22 or 20, you know, you're 21 at this point. They've graduated from high school and they're they're just waiting. Apply for residency. And recently I I've been seeing it be about an eight-month wait between applying for permanent residency this manner and getting a green card. So it's it's still a bit of a wait. Um, it's not as awful as it used to be. Sometimes it can be pretty fast too. And then you get your green card. So right now we're looking at a process that could be four or five years. I've recently helped kids. I've gotten four clients green cards in the last two months who um, started this process in 2016, 2017. So um, it's certainly not fast, um, but it's, it's often the only option for some of these children. And it is a pathway for them to eventually get permanent status. Um, was there another question or no? I thought I saw one. Okay. All right. So um, U visa. So the U visa protects um, victims of certain crimes. I've got a list on the next slide. Oh, yes, Alay. Sorry, there was a question. It just came in right after you said that. Um, do they get the second year, the two year conditional green card? No, they get a full green card. It's out there, residents for how, forever. You know, um, and then in five years, they're eligible to apply for citizenship, not a conditional green card. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> U visa um, sounds like there's some familiarity with U visas. So it's protection for victims of certain crimes. And so the thing here is that you need to, um, you need to have a law enforcement or prosecutor or a judge or CPS certify that you were helpful in like the investigation or prosecution of the crime. So if you hear that you have a client who um, reported some sort of crime to the police, it's possible that they would qualify for this. Um, the tough part is you do need to like get this letter, this certification um, from law enforcement. So it's up to them to agree um, that your client was helpful in order to apply for the visa. You don't have to have any sort of relationship with the perpetrator, um, whereas for VAWA, which we'll talk about um, in the next, the next firm we'll talk about, you do have to have a 
a relationship. The tough thing about U visas is even worse than special immigrant juvenile status, they're taking a decade um, from like start to finish. So that's a slow burn. Um, but you know, for a lot of people, this is the only thing they're eligible for. And if they have a strong case, it's worth it for them to get started on it. Um, yeah. You know, it has to happen inside the United States and they have to have suffered substantial mental or physical abuse. Um, and here's a list of the qualifying crimes. You guys can take a look at it later. Um, <clears throat> so VAWA, this is a protection for spouses and children of either um, US citizens or lawful permanent residents. So they have, who have been you know, victims of abuse. They have to have either still be married or have gotten a divorce in the past few years, or of course, they must still be a child. Um, and the abuser has to be a US citizen or LPR. Um, and also sometimes, especially when you're dealing with children, you might think, oh, well, they're not married. Well, you know, in some cultures, people get married very, very young. So it is possible that the, that the individuals are married and they're not just partners or boyfriend and girlfriend living together. Um, you don't need any sort of law enforcement certification for this one. You can, but you don't need it. And that's, um, that's really nice. Uh, it means you, you're not like reliant on another agency to agree that this happened. Um, and if you can approve, there's no sort of limit to visa. So um, you can obtain your green card right away. You can file concurrently if you want, or you can file, get your VAWA approved and then file for your um, residency afterwards if you'd prefer. Um, it's much, much, much faster than U visa, but they're still taking quite a long time right now. Um, probably more, more like two years. Uh, it, it varies from year to year, but right now it's it's quite a wait. Um, for T visas, those are for victims of trafficking. Um, so victims of severe form of commercialized sex or labor trafficking. Um, they have to have been either through force, fraud, or coercion. And I want you to kind of ex and your definition of what trafficking is. Um, it's not necessarily just the textbook, you were forced to work for no money. Um, I have had clients apply for TV says who were say really poignant one I remember was some children who were forced to clean their house every day. And I don't mean just like they had to vacuum. I mean, this child would wake up in the morning before school scrub the walls, come home from school every day, have to rearrange all of her like stepmother's things on each shelf and just like an, an insane amount of um, labor every day from the time she woke up to the time um, she went to sleep at night, you know, cooking all the meals for the family, doing everything, um, not allowed to socialize with friends, et cetera. So she, and, you know, under force of um, physical abuse. So yeah, it kind of expand your definition and see, you know, when there is, um, you know, labor performed under force, fraud, or coercion. Um, <clears throat> and there's no reporting requirement for children under 18, and you don't need to get a law enforcement certification, um, but you can if you want to. It can be helpful, um, but you do have to make a make a report. Um, and then comply with reasonable requests for assistance in prosecuting. I do think there are exceptions for like severe trauma um, uh, to this reporting requirement though. So. Um, and additionally, you have, to sub you have to suffer extreme hardship involving unusual or severe harm upon return to your home country. And currently we're looking at um, a, a, the chart I looked at the other day said a 17 month processing time, which doesn't surprise me. But it's a shame because it used to be pretty fast. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna conclude with, uh, no, with DACA. So DACA, unlike the rest of these, is not a pathway to permanent citizenship. However, it's something you really should be familiar with if you're not already familiar with, especially for kids in your community and young adults in your community who have been in the United States for a long time. They might be eligible for this, and this gives them a two-year work permit and a social security number, uh, which is just transformative. Um, and of course, you know, under Trump, this was uh, new applications were suspended, but now new applications and renewals are currently being accepted. Um, one of the tough things is the 
the criteria haven't changed. And so at this point, the number of people who are eligible is like kind of smaller and smaller. The, ch people the child or young adult has to have entered before age 16. They have to have been living in the United States since June 15, 2017. So that's 13 years ago, which is unfortunate because there's a lot of kids you know, who have been here for 10 years. That's still a long time. That's still plenty of time to have, you know, culturally, you know, become American, and they would not, um, under this current these current rules, be eligible. Um, they also have to have been born on or after June 16th, 1981. Uh, have been in high school, completed high school, or obtained a GED, not of disqualifying criminal offenses, and then there's some other requirements as well. Yes, Soleil. Sorry, just quick clarification. Must do they, should they have lived in the U.S. since June 15, 2017, or 2007? Oh, sorry, did I say 17? I meant 2007. Yes, yeah. so it's been it's 13 years. Um, they have to have continuously lived in the United States. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's a long time. <laughs> so these are just the ones I've mentioned, the forms of relief that I've mentioned, because those are the ones that most commonly, if you're meeting with a child um, survivor of violence. These are things that they may be eligible for, but there are other forms of relief as well. Um, so really the moral of the story is you've got to connect them to an immigration attorney for a full screening because you really don't know what they're going to be eligible for. Yes, questions? Yes, we got a question about the DACA requirements and is, um, actually we have two questions. Was what influenced this criteria and why did they decide that they needed to enter the US before age 16? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume, um, you know, this was not a law. This was an executive action by Obama. And I'm sure he was trying to make something palatable. You know, it was to, um, to the masses. So, you know, it wasn't people who had just arrived here, but people who um, could be considered to have culturally, um, you know, spent quite a bit of time in America and have like um, acclimated to to life in the United States, but I, I don't I don't really know why they chose this criteria. I think it's important to note too that there are currently um, a number of like bills that I'm, I don't know the specifics, but there are possibilities of creating either revamping this or creating new paths to citizenship or residency um, for um, for children in circ similar circumstances who were brought to the United States as children. Um, and I'm really hoping they will expand the eligibility criteria, at least to DACA, to um, provide more opportunities for other, other young kids who are in the same boat, you know, were brought over as small kids and have been here basically their entire lives. Yes, question? Perfect. Yes, we do have another one. And it's, um, what are some ways in which someone can show there has been extreme emotional abuse from their partner in VAWA? Oh, <laughs> well, this is part of the reason why you need to like work with an attorney because it's a, uh, it's such a case-by-case -case basis thing. We're always going to submit a declaration. Um, and when I work with clients, I get very, very detailed. You know, I will meet with them for hours on end to discuss their relationship with their partner, um, to go back and forth about um, the things they said to them, the things they, the things they did, you know, in their lives, and really paint a picture for the adjudicator so they can see you know, the maybe sometimes just small things really build up over time. Uh, additionally, and this is something I'm gonna mention um, in a minute, we will always try and if we can, if we have the opportunity to, we wanna get psych evaluations um, and letters of support. And so getting an evaluation, a mental health evaluation and, and putting it in the application can help show you know, from uh, the perspective of a mental health um, professional, whether or not the person suffered trauma, you know, we can often we'll, we'll have them meet with a therapist or, you know, a mental health counselor or psychiatrist, and they will be told that the, per, you know, they'll tell us the person has PTSD or a major depressive disorder. Um, so you know, there's definitely ways to, to show the harm. Um, additionally, like letters of support from family members, acquaintances, social workers, anyone who's seen the relationship and who can talk about it um, can really help bolster those claims. Was they, can, they can be hard to show, um, particularly if you're a male. Um, I have 
gotten VAWA for, you know, a male client who suffered lots of verbal abuse from his spouse. And you can almost always expect they're going to send you uh, what we call a RFE, a request for evidence, wanting more evidence if it's a male um, to, to kind of prove it up. They're much more skeptical of males who've suffered such abuse. We got it though. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so um, just a couple of tips, the next few slides, I just have a couple of tips for like when you might encounter immigrant children in your practice. Um, so first, to the extent that you can, make your workplace a welcoming spot for immigrants. You should be providing language services. And at this point, you know, not just Spanish and English, but you should have opportunities. If your community has indigenous language speakers, you should get a contract with the language line or find some local community um, interpreters. Um, especially in Washington state, there are a lot of indigenous, a lot of indigenous people and they will speak some Spanish, but you're not really going to be able to fully get to know them or what's going on with them if you can't speak to them in their first language. So I definitely recommend um, increasing access to language services in your office. I mean, also this might seem like a small thing, but um, putting up posters and signs and things indicating that immigrants are welcome does make a difference. Um, to, to kind of visually see, um, like I put this little example of, you know, a poster, you know, immigration reform now, I know it's in English and everything, but kind of just those like um, visual signals can be comforting and um, make a person know that they're able to open up. Um, I also think it's great when organizations have, you know, know your rights information cards, like at their front desk, um, that can you know, also indicate to people that you know, we take it seriously that you, you know, all immigrants have rights and we want to protect you and be a welcoming spot for you. Um, you should also, to the extent that you can, try not to limit your services based on immigration status. Now, unfortunately, I know that a lot of services, especially with nonprofits, are attached to funding. So there's a lot of organizations that have funding that says that they can only help US citizens. Um, if you can get another source of funding, <laughs> you know, try and um, try and find ways um, to to make it possible for undocumented people to receive services from you or your organization. Also, never report immigrants to ICE and train your staff not to talk to ICE agents and to understand um, um, that then have like a blanket policy that ICE agents do not have permission to enter your business. So ICE agents can enter um, public spaces. So like your lobby, but they can't go, they can't go in the back. They can't go behind the closed doors or like the private personnel doors. Um, in our old office at NERP, you know, we kind of had a policy that if um, for some reason ICE showed up and it never did, but you, you want to have a plan just in case. We would kind of send out an all staff email, um, lock our doors and keep our clients in our, in, in the offices, you know, and don't go out and not let them pass the, the um, public spaces. I don't know, yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to say about that, um, but there are, I know the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project does I think have some um, materials on their websites about biz rights for businesses. So if that's something you're um, curious about, um, I would um, suggest that you look um, at their website um, for those resources to learn about like your rights as like a for your, your business or organization. Another thing that I think is incredibly important is to always um, explain the boundaries of confidentiality as it applies to the work you do. As an attorney, everything that I say to my client, all of our conversations are confidential and I'm not a mandated reporter. So they can tell me anything and I am not telling anything to anyone else without their permission. So they can speak as freely with me as they want to and we can really develop a relationship of trust. Um, they should know if you're not, you're a mandated reporter and you should too. So if you um, talk to a, a client and they disclose abuse and you have to call CPS, um, I mean, you, you, they should just know it. <laughs> they should know it so they know what they can and can feel comfortable telling you. Um, and you should always make clear to them what you do have an obligation to share and what you don't. All right. Okay, so basically you should always send any immigrant child you encounter to speak to an immigration attorney. 
really all the time, just, just do it. That's always the best option is to see um, what they're, you know, just get them that help by connecting them and see what their options are. Um, really, if they're not a permanent resident and they're not a citizen, they should talk to someone. Um, you know, they might be eligible for DACA, even if they're not eligible for a visa. Um, and really, I kind of think if it's, even if it's been like, let's say two years since you've spoken to an immigration attorney, maybe new circumstances in your life or in immigration law have changed and now you're eligible for something. So I would recommend that someone who's been here a long time and been like, oh, like they told me I'm not eligible for asylum. It's like, well, when is the last time you talked to someone? Maybe now you're that person is eligible for a U visa um, or a T visa or DACA, yeah. I think kind of particular flags to keep in mind are whether the, or not the person has been the victim of any sort of crime as mentioned, including domestic violence. Um, if they've ever been forced to work, uh, if they're expressing like significant fear to return to their home country, especially if they have a, a, like a, you know, they've been receiving some sort of threat or have like strong reason to believe that they might be harmed if they return. If they have criminal history, they need to know how that will impact their rights um, and their possible immigration case. Um, also, if they have prior contact with immigration authorities, or if they have a deportation order. Um, sometimes people were ordered deported in immigration court and then they continue living in communities and you know, don't, obviously have not been deported. Um, it's recommended they speak to an immigration attorney to see if there's any opportunities to reopen their case, to apply for new relief or otherwise you know, make their lives a little safer and more comfortable. Um, so where you should refer, I mean, I know we've got some people outside of Washington State on the call, um, but I put on some kind of more Washington State specific resources. Really the only place in Washington to go is Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. It's got offices in Eastern Washington and in Western Washington. Um, there is a very, very small, like one attorney nonprofit um, in Kitsap County that serves, I think Kitsap, um, Mason County, I think that's it. I think maybe, I don't, I don't know if they do any Thurston County clients, um, but Northwest Immigrant Rights Project also serves that area. However, as nonprofits, their waiting lists are really long. I was speaking with one of my former colleagues and she said that her wait list for intakes right now in the children's department, the children's unit in Seattle is six months for an initial intake unless there's um, exigent circumstances like the kid's about to turn 18 or they have a removal order or some other sort of emergency. Um, so, and then there's also, there's ICS and there's a couple other small nonprofits in Oregon. Unfortunately in Oregon, so NERP is 100% free always. ICS in Oregon um, generally does charge some nominal fees. Um, and I've kind of found that to be pretty normal in Portland as there are some fees attached to even the nonprofit services. Um, so you can also use, so especially like say, I know that there are people from Nevada, this link I put at the bottom of this slide um, is to an online legal services directory and you can search by zip code and you can also filter and it'll list all the nonprofits in your state. Definitely recommend it, it's well updated. All right, so the waiting lists are really long. There's also private attorneys and there's a lot of wonderful truly excellent private attorneys. And yeah, they're gonna cost money because they've, they've got to make a living, they've got to do their jobs. Um, I would recommend using alalawyer.com to search for private attorneys. You can filter by language, by zip code, I've got the thing there so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, there's only one like Immigration Lawyers Association and it's ALA. So like basically all the immigration attorneys are members of this organization. Um, and I would use this lawyer search to avoid um, your clients using notarios, which are basically people who are engaging in unauthorized practice of law um, without a legal degree, um, without licensing. Um, so if you go through here, you're definitely gonna get an attorney because every member of ALA is a licensed attorney. Um, are there any questions right now? I think that's... Okay, so um, the last kind of like slide in my main presentation is um, just kind of a call um, to ask you to help your clients um, if they are working with an attorney 
um, they might need your help. I know you have people here who do a variety of different careers um, and you might be really instrumental to the success of this person's case, especially if you have a strong relationship with them. Um, so one thing that is incredibly helpful um, is being willing to write a letter of support. And this really depends on the type of case. Uh, but sometimes discretion is in play when determining whether or not to grant something. And, you know, if you have a letter from a social worker or a, someone else who's been, you know, have, has a consistent relationship with them that just says how you've seen this person grow, what their connections are to their family, what their connections are to their community, um, and, you know, signed by like a professional, that can be really helpful um, and will be submitted alongside other materials to kind of bolster their claim. And I know sometimes people get a little scared about this, like it's a, like it's a political thing and maybe it's inappropriate. Um, you shouldn't feel that way. You know, you're not the, you are not the person deciding whether or not to grant this case. You're not the person determining whether or not they're eligible for it. All you're doing is talking only about your limited experiences and your relationship with them. If you feel very uncomfortable, you don't even need to make a, a plea at the end saying, please grant this. You know, you can just limit it to the facts as you know them. So it's always nice to, you know, say how this would help them. Um, additionally, like I mentioned earlier, we like getting mental health evaluations when we're trying to prove that um, a client has suffered trauma and that circumstances have been, um, you know, have harmed the client in like a non-tangible way. If we can't take a picture of scars, how are we supposed to show this harm? And we do this through um, mental health evaluations generally, but often we're sending the client to a counselor, a therapist, or a psychologist that has never met the client before. And so all of the information they have in this evaluation is from their two to four hours of you know, fact finding and going through um, different evaluations with the client. It can really um, bolster their case if they do have a, a continuous relationship with a, with a therapist or a mental health provider. Um, and so if, if you're a mental health provider and you're able to provide, um, either you're able to do the evaluation yourself or you're willing to provide you know, notes and records to help the attorney build the case or to supplement um, that evaluation, that is awesome. Uh, there's also, if you are a mental health provider in Washington state, there's a really great nonprofit that trains people to give mental health evaluations um, for asylum seekers. It's a wonderful thing to get involved in and it is just it can make or break someone's case. Um, if you want information about that, you can contact me later and I'm more than happy um, to share information with you. So, and of course, beyond all this, you know, make sure you're receiving a consent to share this information. Talk to your client first, talk to the attorney first. I always recommend getting it in writing that you have um, permission to share, you know, to work, to write this letter, share their records. Um, written consent is always best. Uh, and make sure you're following whatever your organizational or, you know, licensing protocols are um, before you share records. I think <clears throat> that's the end of my presentation. Um, so, I'm open for more questions um, if people have any. And this is my information, and I reiterated the contact information for her. Oops, I didn't update the email in the slide, but I can see that later and send it out to you. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, it's blinking. All right. Well, we are not showing any questions, but I did put all of your contact information in the chat. Great. Um, as well as the contact information for NERP. Great. Yeah. And I, I'm not in Washington anymore, so you can feel free to email me, but I'm not going to be the person that is assisting your client in the end. So it's probably better to contact an organization closer to home, unless you're in Southern California. In which case, I probably still won't be working with your client unless they're in a detention facility or recently released to a family member. Um, well, since we have five more minutes, I've got a couple extra slides um, that are I figured I would share in case we had some more time. Um, 
I just like kind of making sure people have at least a little bit of background on their rights and ICE encounters. Uh, and this is information you can share with your clients. Like I said, um, I recommend you know providing know your rights information, having it posted or like little little cards and stuff in your office. ACLU um, has some great resources for this. I think, I don't know if you have to like ask them to be mailed to you or you can download them, but I would definitely look at the ACLU website. So first of all, everyone has basic rights. The right to remain silent isn't dependent on your citizenship. And most instances, voluntary disclosure is how immigration ends up knowing someone's undocumented. They'll come to the door and be like, oh, um, so do you have your boyfriend's uh, ID card? And they'll be like, oh God, you know, yes, of course I do. And then someone runs and shows their like Mexican passport, you know, kind of in the heat of the moment and in fear, you know, voluntary disclosure is, you know, how they're understanding that the person is not a US citizen. So definitely never um, hand over um, an undocumented person's foreign documents and don't carry any false documents either. <clears throat> um, so everyone also has the right to be safe in their own home. So in order to enter a home, you still need a court warrant um, from a court. They will sometimes show ICE warrants. It's really confusing because they, they kind of make them look similar, but it's not a court warrant. It's administrative, not judicial. So I would, you know, I've, I've heard like have them push it under the door, or hold it up to the window to like make sure that the warrant is up and then read it to make sure it's actually a judicial warrant. <clears throat> So don't sign, don't have a client, don't have an undocumented person sign any documents without legal help um, because that could waive their legal rights. So truly what, what a person should be doing is providing their name, asking to speak an attorney and being silent. It's really important that you do give an accurate name because you need to be located. Your you know, family members, friends, your attorney, they're gonna wanna find you. And the first place to look is in the ICE detainee locator. And if you've used a false name, we will not be able to find you. No one will be able to find you. Um, so use a real name. Uh, and then yeah, contact an attorney or legal services on behalf of that person as quickly as possible to provide them with assistance. Um, there's a question. Yes, um, we have a question that came in that says, do you have visuals as to what ICE warrants look like as opposed to court warrants? I did, and I didn't include it in the slideshow. I wanted to keep it short. Um, I did. I'm sorry. I don't have him with me. I don't think I added it. No, did I? No, nope, I didn't add it. So even though the one I had, I, the reason I didn't add it is because it was from a few years ago and I just didn't know how accurate it was. Um, so I think you just have to read it, read it carefully. <laughs> um, and yeah, so when someone gets um, apprehended by ICE, they're brought to a detention facility. And the, in Washington state, um, so for Washington, Oregon, Idaho, um, I think Montana too, so they might know even more than I do. Um, in Alaska, people are all brought to the detention facility, you know, generally brought to the detention facility in Tacoma, Washington. Um, the Washington did recently pass a law that's gonna end private detention. So I don't know what the plan is when that detention facility closes in Washington. Um, and once they're detained, they're going to need an attorney. So they need to know their rights and speak to legal services as quickly as possible. Um, and it's possible they'll be able to be released on bond, but a lot of people and, um, can't afford the bonds because they're so high. Now we've run out of time, but I'm going to distribute this and I'm just going to recommend um, looking at this ACLU We Have Rights video set. There are subtitles, um, closed captioning. And they are provided in English, Spanish, and actually, I believe, quite a few other languages if you go to the We Have Rights website. Um, they're really beautifully done animated videos um, that walk through a number of different scenarios. Um, this one is in their streets. There's one where you're in your home, and I believe there's one in your workplace as well, or there's one like once you're in detention. Um, they're all like four minutes long, animated, really explain um, the situation very well of what the rights are and, and what is the right thing to do in each situation. I often um, show these videos to my clients who are illiterate, who I don't feel comfortable sending them home with like a packet on know your rights. I'll sit there in my office and I'll play these videos with them and talk through them with them. Um, so yeah, I can't recommend them enough for people of all ages. Yeah, so 2.30,
Um, I can stick around and answer a couple more questions, but just thank you so much for, um, for coming today. I hope you learned something. Um, and yes, you can feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions in the future. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, Nori, uh, yes, you can sign language for a question. Um, let me see how I can put you on the view here. Um, okay, wait, so I'm gonna, Give me a second, Nori. Okay. So you should be available now to ask um, to sign your question. Okay, just one moment here. Yeah, I can see you. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing about ice. Um, one thing that has been bothering me about ICE is why it's, I mean, I know it's important, but really, you know, they don't have improved, uh, approved reasons, you know. I mean, they have reasons that they, obviously they have to do things, but um, I guess my, my, I'm trying to understand why ICE is so important. I mean, I think ICE should be abolished. <laughs> Oh, hold on one second. I have to pin the interpreter. I yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, ICE doesn't really help. They don't help any, anything. So, I mean, they're cruel. They're, I, I feel like there's almost, there's no reason for them. I mean, I think there are some people in the country who disagree, which is the problem, but ultimately I, I completely agree with you. Oh, hold on I, one second. I can't see the interpreter. One moment. No. 